Okay, off the bat, full spoilers for the story of Xenoblade 3, Future Redeemed. Let's just get that out the way, and let's proceed. So I beat the game last night on stream, and to say I had mixed emotions and was left kind of speechless would be an understatement. There are things about the ending in the story of Future Redeemed that I absolutely adore. Bringing in Xenosaga is a cool idea, and great for Saga fans, we'll get to that. Seeing Klaus's world was amazing and a great way to bring the series up to now full circle. Rex, Shulk, and Ace sacrificing themselves was kind of what I predicted, but still was a great send-off for those characters, at least for now, since Rex tells you they'll be back. The story with Antos, and and the Liberators was expertly executed and well handled. But I said I had mixed emotions, and if you were there on stream, you probably heard me say that I didn't like the ending. Now, this is why I scrapped a recording that I did right after stream and slept on it. Because I know how I process endings that have a sense of vagueness to them, and it normally takes me a bit to digest it and warm up to them. I far prefer endings that are more cut and dry. They don't have to be cut and dry, and it depends upon the execution of the ending, that's just a personal preference for me. But I do need to clarify something. These are all just my opinions. I am not saying I'm some kind of arbiter of truth and some golden ray of sunlight to be used to identify what a great story or ending is. I can only give you my interpretation, my impressions, and how I personally felt about how the events played out. And if you loved the ending, and you thought it was the perfect send-off, understand that I want to be able to feel that way. I don't take joy or pleasure in making this video because I wanted to make a video where I could just gush about Future Redeemed, but I'm not going to lie to you all. So I have two main issues with the ending that subvert a lot of my personal enjoyment. One of them is far greater than the other, however. Let's start off with the minor one. Number one, and like I said, in the grand scheme of it all, and the more I think about it, I'm bothered by it, less and less, the Xenosaga stuff. Now, I just said before that it was kind of cool that they brought Saga into the lore, right? And it is. Slight problem, though, I never touched Xenosaga. I don't know the stories or characters outside of Cosmos and Telos being in two, I have none of that context, and all I got was the messages from the Saga fans in my chat trying to explain and contextualize things for me on a moment's notice, and it just won't bear the same emotional weight or have the context experiencing those stories would naturally give you. So the Saga elements of the ending, while may have resonated super hard for some people, don't do a single thing for me because I just lack that data bank of knowledge and references. And in the moment, I felt it was a bigger deal to me because, or at least a bigger deal than I feel right now, because after watching the Chapter 5 cutscenes again, you kinda don't need to know Saga for the ending to work. Absolutely, 100% it helps. But all it does is make the radio part hit harder, whereas if you don't know Saga, you can just pay attention to Niall and Matthew talk, and then the blue light in the post credit scene may be Cosmos from Untold, from the ending of Xenosaga 3, I watched the ending, or at least that post credit scene in Xenosaga 3, and it seems like it matches up, where she is apparently searching for New Jerusalem, and this new world is meant to be that, I guess. Knowing Saga adds a bunch of context and makes everything fall into place, but if you don't have that knowledge, it just hits less. And my other problem with Saga is that it's not easily accessible. It's not like I can just pop over to the eShop or the PlayStation Store, or even Steam, buy the games, and then just stream them. No, the only way would be to emulate them, which is something I try and stay away from on the channel. Which just kind of sucks, because the only way I could experience those games now would be to go out of my way to find a way to get a PS2 or a PS3 or backwards compatibility, and then find copies of those games, and then buy them and then play them. Which is just a massive hassle right now. Or I walk along the lines of legality and emulate. Those aren't adequate solutions in my opinion makes me kind of think we could get a Saga remaster, or at least ports, since Bandai Namco in the credits. Maybe some deal was struck, I don't know, maybe it was just for this game or for those one or scattered references. It's possible, I imagine they would see more success nowadays with the recent popularity of Xenoblade than back when Saga first released. I'm hopeful, but I'm not banking on it. So right, the Saga stuff is cool and all, and the more I think about it, the less annoyed I am by it. Because it really doesn't detract from the story that's actually going on in Future Redeemed, it just kind of adds to it. That is, until we get to the second point of my main piece of criticism for the ending, at least for me, which left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. The post credit scene. So after quite possibly the most fitting song and credit sequence to close us out, I could ever possibly fathom. Seriously, it's freaking musical perfection. I love this song, and this whole credit sequence. I've been listening to this song 
all day today. We are showing Jupiter with the big red spot, so it's unmistakably our solar system like we saw at the end of Xenoblade 1. We then pan over to the two worlds, seemingly right after Xenoblade 3 and the activation of Origin. I imagine Ouroboros are running away from each other over the world splitting apart right about here. But then the worlds fully separate, which is what we expected to happen. Okay, kind of weird that we're being shown this perspective, but okay, what we got here. And then the worlds begin to glow, like they're going Super Saiyan or something. And then we just see one world after a flash of light. And we wait a few seconds to process that. And then we see this blue shooting star-esque object come into view from the top right corner of the screen. Moves towards this new world and then fades to black. Right. So why did this leave a sour taste in my mouth? Well, largely personal preference, duh. Like I said before, vague endings take some time for me to warm up to and for me to digest. It's a personal thing, and like how I eventually warmed up to the ending of Xenoblade 3, because if you were around back then, you may recall me not liking 3's ending all that much at the time. To me, this ending didn't give me a sense of satisfaction, or a sense of finality for the trilogy over the Klaus Saga. It could for others, just didn't do it for me. I walked away feeling blue-balled more than anything by what happened, where I now potentially have to wait about four years if we're being generous for a potential follow-up to this. And maybe that was the point? That we don't know what's next? The theory I operated under when I beat the DLC was that the worlds merged at the end of the post credit scene. However, like with most vague endings, that is but one interpretation. I can't think of a reason why it couldn't just have been them showing us one of the worlds that is now separated at the end of Xenoblade 3. And we just don't get to see the others, to showcase that these worlds are now fully separate. And that the totally not cosmos thing approaching could be a factor in Xenoblade 4, maybe. I think that the, with the way the scene is framed, it makes sense to believe the worlds recombined. And that may be what they go with in the future. And honestly, it was how I interpreted the scene immediately. It's also a big reason I was hesitant on this ending. And even said that I didn't like it, because it was so quick. I thought at some point the worlds would combine, so that part doesn't get me. It was just the execution of it. Because to me, if the worlds just recombined like that, and it's job done, and it's never mentioned again, then that severely undercuts the emotional impact and stakes of 3 for me. Especially the ending. Which was already an ending that I had to warm up to, but was also contingent on what came afterwards. For an ending marked by its emotional impact of having these groups of people who had grown so close willfully sacrifice their happiness and togetherness to preserve their worlds and the concept of the future itself to just wrap it up in about a 15 second span in a post credit scene for a prequel story that didn't have to do with that bit directly, it just felt quick and abrupt and kind of dismissive of the weight that 3 held for me. Also, what was the actual timetable on those events? Because that's another factor here. Did they just immediately merge? Or was it over a long period of time? When the worlds merged, were all the people essentially wiped out and life restarted from scratch again? Because I would hate that direction personally. Or were the people of both worlds just thrown onto this new merged world, which is a direction I personally hope for? And knowing we probably won't get a follow-up story, if there even is one, for around 4 or 5 years is the real gut punch here for me. Because we just don't know, but again, that's also kind of the point. That the future is essentially an unknown, and maybe there's a bit of poetry in that. Xenoblade 3's post credit scene has been completely recontextualized because trying to make heads or tails of it now is like trying to see things in the fourth dimension. Why and where did the off-scene tune come from? Where did, no where did Noah go? Why did he hear it? And if the worlds really did recombine, then why was Noah the one to disappear? Or is it a case that he just went first? Because he was Ouroboros or something. Did the worlds not actually combine? But did they interlink instead? Because of the combined will of all the people of the worlds, but also Rex, Shulk, and A who now serve as the avatar for Origin? Did that play a factor into it? Is the plot of Xenoblade 4 to prevent the interlink from fading away this time? There's so many questions and so many paths that this story can go from here, and again, that's kind of the point. And until we get confirmation as to what the hell the direction for the series is going, we just don't know. And the more I think about it, the more I realize one of my deeper issues with the ending is that it's a world-based story finale, and I care more about the Xenoblade characters than I did for the worlds themselves, whose fates now are just a giant question mark because of the post credit scene. And I'm going to ask you all this question because I don't know. When do we think Saga took place? Before, during, or after Blade? Because if it's after what we have for Blade right now, then that means Blade was just a prequel for a story that I don't have access to. Which then brings us back around to my early con earlier concerns about Saga and its availability. 
This is why I generally dislike vague endings, because I don't get a sense of finality from them. I just get questions and a sign that says, now wait if it even if ever comes. It's personal preference, yeah, but I can't change how I feel. There's ways this story can proceed from here that I think would be genuinely interesting that I would be sold on, the world having interlinked at the end and for being about preventing them from separating again, the worlds did actually merge, and the people of 1 and 2 are now living on a cohabitated world, and the story about them coming together or something, or the worlds are still separate, but with the help of maybe Cosmos or whatever the hell the blue light thing was, we find a way to merge the worlds again. Those are directions I think are all possible, and that I would find interesting. And here are the ones I would find less interesting by, or less interested by, or just turned off by. The worlds just merge, and it's never talked about again, and that's how the story of Xenoblade just ends, and we move on to something new from here, that would suck for me. The worlds merge, but the people of Xenoblade 1 and 2 are wiped out in the process, which I'm really banking on the idea that this one is unlikely, since the plot of Future Redeemed was that we fought to save everyone, including the people of Kevis and Agnes. Xenoblade was just a prequel for Saga, though this one may be a non-issue since I don't know Saga, or could just be impossible depending on what the Saga's lore is. And with the amount of times they said we'll see each other again in the ending of 3, and with Vex basically saying the same thing at the end of Future Redeemed, I'm hopeful that the path they walk from here will be one of the ones I just laid out that I'm optimistic about. So the world's interlinking, or that they now live in a cohabitated world have to work together, or that the world is still separate and we have to find a way to merge them. I'm far more interested in those stories. And like I said, maybe where we go from here is a follow-up to both Blade and Saga. Maybe. That would be cool. And I want to not hate the ending, so I'm going to operate under that assumption. Until we get evidence to the contrary. It helps that I think the ones I like the most, for where we go from here, are also the ones I think are the most likely in my eyes. I can't see them realistically wiping out all the characters from 1 and 2 after we just beat Alpha to defend them in Future Redeemed. That just sounds stupid and dumb to me. I'll make theory videos on those possible paths and what they could entail or be about, or be thematically about. And don't worry, I got more Xenoblade content on the way. Because like this series is all about, when one door closes, we walk on to another, to open that one and find out what lies beyond. So yeah, a mixed bag of emotions for me with the ending of Future Redeemed. Maybe it's fitting, maybe I'll come around to love it even more, or maybe I'll just sour on it, depending upon what path they decide to go from here. Only time will tell. But I want to thank you all for tuning in. My pleasure for making the video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out and helps support future content, and I greatly appreciate it. Yep, here's to the future, everybody. Stay safe, have a great day. If you liked the video, please leave a like and subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be notified when I upload in the future. Stay safe, have a great day. Go play some video games if you can. As always, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye, everybody.